Hi all, I'd like to revisit the evolution of Chess Style series. Um, we had been looking at some of the Steinitz Shigorin matches, and I thought, well, we could skip ahead now to look at Tarash. And I ordered from Amazon Modern Ideas in Chess by Richard Retty, which has some ideas about the evolution of style. And basically, um, you know, Sigbert Tarash, uh, according to Retty, you know, carried the torch more and he, he, for Steinitz ideas. He said Steinitz was too new for his time here. And um, if I can quote some of it, um, it's a good book, you know, I recommend it, uh, Modern Ideas in Chess. So Richard Retty was one of the hyper-moderns, um, hyper being a sort of word for excitable, I suppose, uh, or overexcited, hyper, hyperactive, um, hyper-modern. Um, I'm not sure if he was totally endeared to that term. But anyway, he was saying basically that um, f things... Um, like in in Steinitz's ideas that um, about the extended knight maneuvers, the the apparent withdrawal of well well posted pieces, the contempt for the momentary as opposed to the permanent positions, I um, so that that was all a bit ahead of time for Steinitz, and Tarish put a new spin on in particular cramped positions, and of course he invented the Tarash defence, uh, you know still a very well respected. You know, defense going for active peace play and great space, but you you know you, you end up with nice that queen's pawn quite often. But um, here is one game where Tarash is punishing Sletter for having, uh, le you know, letting her have kind of a, a, a mobility advantage. But funny enough, Tarash was playing white here. So let's let's have a look at this. So e4. E5 and Tarash played knight f3, knight c6, then we have bishop b5. So d6, which was a kind of um, big, kind of symptomatic a bit, I, I think, of, of Steinitz because he played stodgy stuff. But here, you know, white plays kind of energetically, even apparently creating some weaknesses on the king side later, but um, to, to try and exploit black seemingly passive position. So queen takes d4. We have this kind of little center I think it's called so where there's where's one pawn here and potentially it looks as though you know maybe you know white can flood the center later but it's not not so easy in practice here white built up very carefully with b3 um, so he's putting that bishop on a potentially sensitive diagonal but it's only sensitive if, if this diagonal can be undermined and we're going to see later believe it or not this pawn having an effect obviously not here but uh, white builds up more, um, so rook d3, the rook can now switch across the third rank, but actually it first supports e4. So this idea of first reinforcing the position before going on to the attack. And I think that's a great way, actually, this is one of my, my new theories, um, of, you know, if you don't want to play controversially, think about that, the idea of preparing before the punch, basically. If you're in a boxing match, not that I've never done boxing, but preparing punches so here you know white strengthening the center it doesn't need to you know indulge in any controversial moves here just building up his position very slowly so that's why this game is kind of instructive so e4 is very well reinforced and you know h3 deprives the knight of g4 and the rook can swing to g3 and you know there's potential latent threats of knight d5 and stuff so c6 actually stops knight d5 and does that stop the fun, though? You know, I suppose you could argue, well, the rook on e6 is defending f6, so there's no problem for this discovery either. But it's played with the idea now of getting a greater grip on the centre. He plays now c4, Tarash, so that's a kind of what later was known as Maroxy bind, trying to deprive black of a freeing move like d5. So here, um, the downside though, you know, c5 and e5 might be good for a black knight. So knight d7, it's tested, rook h1, and now f6, seemingly, uh, you know, locking down this diagonal. So how, how can white increase the pressure now? So queen c2, knight e5. You know, is black solid here? So the knight goes back. So white's got a good grip on d5. What has he achieved in the last few moves? Well, he made way for the pawn to come to c4. He's got a nice lock now down on, on d5. So knight f7. And it's here white starts to uh, throw the punches now. He plays the move g4. So seemingly 
you wouldn't normally play this unless you've really reinforced your position in the centre. Because usually, you know, the, the flank attack is parried by the central attack. But d5 might be out of the question here. Queen a5, and now rook d1. Putting more pressure on that d5 square. And now h4, so seemingly more sort of recklessness. But it's justified, perhaps, because... Um, you know, if if black can't counterattack, then then where's where's the problem? Now here, rook g3. So the rook goes behind the pawn. If you're going to blast sort of holes into the opponent's uh, king position, the first battery needs to be with pawns supported by pieces behind them. So now f3 again, reinforcing the center. So e4 in particular. Knight h8, seemingly awkward passive move. Knight e2. Bishop's ready to tear apart this diagonal but first more preparation now before this punch is thrown of g5 building up behind g5 again knight d4 nice positional knight f5 and according to chess gamescom there's a repetition here but some sources just say move 31 was just g5 straight off so was it here or move 31 i don't really know but anyway finally um g5 is played so look at white's uh, resources all coordinating on g7 here. So he's going to peel open the file. And he's, he's basically, from a stylistic point of view, the point of this, this game I think white was chosen by Richard Retty is like, you know, how to punish, you know, seemingly passive but solid um, positions. So the key, I think, was gradual reinforcement of the centre, slow preparation, until finally, you know, frame the punches like with g5. And I think this is an important thing to remember for our own games. So rook takes g5. There's a lot of pressure building up now. g6, yes, seemingly um, not great, but it's difficult for black to do anything. So knight f5, the pieces are coming in for the kill. And against this, black played rook e5. So why did black have to play... Rook e5, you might be wondering. Um, I think this is big trouble now because if, say, rook e6, I think maybe just queen c3 is tempting. Um, I don't really want to check it with rip. It just, it just seems crushing. How does black defend h8? I think that's the move. Just queen c3. So after, you know, black's weakened this, this diagonal and, and is now just being slaughtered. f4. Black the sacks the exchange, but it's really hopeless. Just FG, and now Black resigns here. He's still going to get battered with like F5 coming up. So if HG or Knight G6, just F5, I think. It's getting better on the G file. Um, let's have a look in overview and summary of this game. So it's how to punish really a crap position. So I think there's a key principle here of not playing wild stuff, but just slow uh, reinforcements of the center, making sure the opponent hasn't got any counter-attack opportunities. Moroxy binds, if possible. Don't worry about giving up some dark squares or, or black blocking the diagonal temporarily. And now start lashing out once everything's secure. It's more justified. Building up, though, behind the pawn break. And, and then the cracks start to show when you know g5 it induces a great deal of potential pressure on g7 with knight f5 in the air everything coordinating now on g7 so it's a bit of a, a masterful exploitation of a space advantage so we're going to see further examples of this from tarash and so he's refining steinitz's um theories a little bit you know for the accumulation of advantages that sometimes it's nice to enjoy solid space advantage and more mobility um, please leave any comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.